Amen. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 13 is where we're going to start. In verse 13 it says, Now abides faith, hope, charity, or love. Um, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. That's the King James translation. The, the word charity here is agape. The reason that the King James translators translated the word agape as charity is they were trying to show, almost all modern translations translate it love, but they were trying to show that it's, it's not a regular kind of love, like, like natural love. It's, it's undeserved. Charity is undeserved, and that's why they use the word charity here. But it says the greatest of these is <clears throat> love. Now, as we talked about this series, I think that almost all humans know this instinctively, that... Um, it's something that we know, it is impressed upon us, and you can just think a, min a minute about, well, in fact, soldiers that are dying on the battlefield, it's very common for, for the last words that come out of their mouth, if they know that death is imminent, that they're going to tell someone, you know, if they can possibly tell my wife that I love her, or tell my folks that I love them, give a message to so-and-so. Instinctively, we reach out to people that we love. We read when we started this some messages on 9-11, people that were trapped in, the, in the, the buildings in New York as they went down and, and the messages that they tried to get out and, and that they were successful in some cases getting out messages. And then <clears throat> we even had messages from the plane, uh, the, the United Flight 93, that went down in Pennsylvania and, and uh, messages that were sent from loved ones to their loved ones. And instinctively, people reach out for people that they love when they know, you know, this life is about to end, and, and they're not thinking about their bank account. Uh, there's no record that anybody said, I, last thing I want to do is really check to see how much money did I have saved up, or <clears throat> what was my grade point average in school, or are there any last-minute details that I need to do at work to take care of? instinctively we realize that we need to reach out to people that we love because just like it says love, the greatest of these is love. And even instinctively we know that when, it, when we really get focused on what is important in life. Now, <clears throat> the whole issue is we know that love is the most important thing. In fact, you know, a number of years ago I was thinking about this. They did a big study of terminally ill children. And they were asking them, <clears throat> what's the most important thing? And it was very interesting that these children, I mean, they're just young, and in many cases, in fact, a huge majority of them would say, well, the most important thing is love. And it, we seem to know that instinctively from the time we're little to the time that we leave the earth. And uh, everybody wants to reach out and communicate with and to someone that we love. But in spite of knowing instinctively that love is so important, most of the time, the truth is we do not love well. And we go through life, and in many cases, we are, you know, we end up fighting and having strife and division. We can look at our country. <clears throat> we see that 50%, more than 50% of the marriages end in divorce. The people didn't get married to be divorced. They never, they never had that in their plan at all but they didn't know how to love well. And we end up fighting and having division and strife and even hating people that we really should be loving, but we don't know how to love well. And we go through life and we leave a train wreck of relationships and we're mad and we're upset and we say things to our loved ones, our spouse, even our children, our parents. We say things we shouldn't say. We know it's not right, but we just have difficulty even though we know how important love is, we have great difficulty as humans learning to love well. And we talked a little bit about why that, you know, there's the God kind of love that comes to you when you're a believer. But, but today I want to really focus in on why do we have so much trouble with this? I mean, we know how important it is. What is the problem? And is, is this problem that we have, <clears throat> is it fixable? Can we fix it? What can we do to take care of this? And that's kind of what I'm going to focus in. So I'm just going to, that's what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> Why do we have so much trouble <clears throat> loving the way that we should, even though we know that love is so important? And I'm just going to give you three things. The first thing is this, the problem is inside us. Everybody say it out loud. The problem is inside us. Now, I know when I say that, 
you know, we, we, we live in a culture that they don't say that. In fact, it's totally opposite of what the culture says. But in James chapter 4, verse 1, here's what the, problem, here's what the scripture says here. Do you know where your fights and arguments come from? They come from the selfish desires that make war inside you. Everybody say inside you. Now, that's totally contrary to what our culture teaches. We have a culture universally that teaches that really the problem, the reason that the Christians and the Muslims can't get along together is because we just don't take time to really understand each other. We need more education, and if we had more education, we could understand each other. We need to be more thoughtful, considerate, learn to listen and understand, and if we did that, everything would work out. Uh, we, have, we have all of the culture that says it's because of environmental factors. <clears throat> The reason there's so much murder in Chicago is because of the environment that they're in. It's an environmental factor, and if you could fix the environmental factor, then everything would be okay. We have culture that says, well, it's social injustice, and because of social injustice, that's why we have murder and fighting and strife and robbery and sin and lying and stealing, and it's because of social injustice, and it's because of financial inequality, and if somehow or another we could take all the wealth and distribute it and make everybody have their own little pile of money and then everything would be all right and that's totally not what the scripture teaches all that stuff is baloney because the problem is not just environmental factors the problem is not just that you don't have money the problem is on the inside of you and the problem is sin sin is inside people they have a sin nature on the inside of them until you deal with that you're never going to get to the root of the problem. In fact, one of the crises we have in the United States, very interesting if you study it a little bit, uh, in, our, in our most privileged universities in the United States, the Ivy League schools, the Ivy League colleges that we have in the United States, you know one of the crises that we're, they're having in Ivy League schools? You know what it is? They're having to dispense medicine, uh, all kinds of drugs to these most wealthy and privileged young people in America more than they've ever had to do before. It's a crisis. They're depressed. They've done everything. They've tried everything. They're full of depression and strife, fighting, and so they're dispensing pills at an alarming rate. How come they're not happy? They have money. How come they're not happy? They have great education. How come they're not happy? They come from the most wealthy and influential families. What's the issue? The issue is sin. Because the problem is not just an environmental factor. The problem is on the inside of us, and the problem is sin. So the rich still divorce, they still hate, they still betray, they still kill, the educated still lie, and they still cheat, and they still steal, and they still murder, and they're still self-seeking. So it wouldn't really matter about a whole lot of the environmental factors because the issue is sin. And you can see that in the scripture, another scripture that bears it out. In, in Romans chapter 7, notice what it says here. Romans 7 verse 18. For I know that in me, here's the apostle Paul, I know that in me, there, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. So he's making an indictment on humanity. He said he came from the same background, and he said, we have this problem. We want to do evil. I mean, we don't want to do evil. We want to do good. Some of you want to do evil, but we don't want to do evil. <clears throat> we want to do good. We want to control our temper. We want to speak right to our, to our spouse. We want to love them the right way. We want to control our flesh, but there's a big problem. We want to do what's right, but he said, I don't do what's right. I do what I shouldn't do. Well, why is it that way? It's because the problem is on the inside of us. Now, even in our culture, it's interesting, some who are honest in our culture, even when they're not trying to be, they just blurt it out. They realize that the problem is not out here, the problem's inside. In fact, I, I wrote these lyrics down. There's a, a band called One Republic. I'm not recommending the band. I don't know anything about them, never heard their song. I just got their words but they have a song called Better, and they're very popular in our young culture, this band called One Republic. And so I wrote down these lyrics. <clears throat> Here's one of the lyrics to their song. The song was called Better, and it says, I tell myself I'll change, 
that's right, I tell myself I'll change, but then I begin to realize that the problem's inside my veins. That's, that's, that's his way of saying that I found out that I want to change, but there's an issue, and the issue is really inside me. And that's exactly true. That's a correct diagnosis. The problem, the reason we do not love well is not because of all these environmental things. It's because we have an issue of selfishness and sin that's on the inside of us. <clears throat> sin is the opposite of God, and it's the opposite of love, <clears throat> because God is love. And the sin nature is a nature of selfishness. <clears throat> and when we have that nature of selfishness on the inside of us, it's totally opposite to God, who is love. So the whole reason that we don't love well is because on the inside of us we have this propensity to sin. We have sin on the inside of us. The good news, which is point two, is Jesus makes us new inside and frees us from sin. Now I want you to stay with me. I want you to listen to this. So here in, in Romans chapter 7, Paul is making an indictment on humanity and himself saying this is why, you know, I have this thing going on here. He got victory over it, but in in Romans chapter 7, notice what he says here in verse 24. He says, Oh, what a miserable person I am who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. Then he goes to verse 25. Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. But what's the answer? He says, the answer is in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Everybody say it out loud. The answer is in Jesus Christ. So Jesus did something. The reason we have all of this going on in culture, the reason we have a message that has to get out, the only way you're going to be free, the only way you're ever possibly going to love well and be the kind of husband, be the kind of boss, be the kind of employee, be the kind of parent, be the kind of child that you're going to be is you have to learn to love well and the only way you're ever going to love well is you have to go to the Lord Jesus Christ who can free you from sin on the inside of you. In Ephesians chapter 2, notice what the scripture says here. Very good. Ephesians 2 verse 3. <clears throat> here, listen to this. Very interesting. Among these we, as well as you, once lived and conducted ourselves in the passions of our flesh our behavior was governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the impulses of the flesh and the thoughts of the mind, our cravings dictated by our senses and our dark imaginings. We were then by nature children of God's wrath and heirs of his indignation like the rest of mankind. Notice what it says. But God, everybody say, but God. So rich is he in his mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us, even when we were dead by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. Listen, he gave us the very life of Christ himself. Notice this part, the same new life with which he quickened him. The same new life with which he made him alive. The same new life. So when you give your life to Jesus Christ, when you accept Christ, you get something. You get the very life of Christ himself. The same new life. The word here is zoe, the life of God. You get this same new life that quickened Christ. For it's by grace, his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you're saved, delivered from judgment, and made a partaker of Christ's salvation. So when you give your life to Christ, something happens to you. This old man that was dominated by sin, the Bible says, I think it's 2 Corinthians 4, 16, that we have an outward man and an inward man. Well, the inward man is the man that's full of sin. He's full of death, and he, is, he propels you to sin, and he influences your body to do that. When you come to Christ, the old man, as the Bible says in Galatians 2.20, crucified with Christ. He's buried. He's crucified. He's killed. But you still have the same body that you did. But on the inside of you, you have the new life of Christ, and you become free on the inside, and you really don't have in your spirit or in your inward man, you don't have a propensity to sin. 
You don't have it because you have new life on the inside of you and the death and the corruption that propelled you to sin, that man is gone and buried and you become a new person in Christ Jesus. And that's what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 5. Notice what it says in verse 17. It says, therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, he is a new creation or the Messiah. He's a new cre creation, a new creature altogether the old previous moral and what kind of condition? Moral and what? Thank you for that one spiritual. The new, it says, the, the old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. What spiritual condition? Spiritual death. A spirit that was dominated by death and dominated by sin. It says we have an, the old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. The fresh and the new has come. So the spiritual condition that propelled you to sin, this sin nature that dominated us, it was passed away and we became new people in Christ Jesus. We're brand new in Christ. Jesus did something about sin. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him to be sin for us to bear our sin in his own body on the tree. He bore our sin. He became sin for us who knew no sin so we could be made the righteousness of God. The Amplified says we could be endued with righteousness. You get righteousness on the inside. You get life on the inside. So none of you are propelled to sin by, from the inside out. None of us. None of us that have really been born again and came into the kingdom of God were new on the inside. We have the life of God in us and really we don't want to sin on the inside and when you miss it on the inside, when you miss it by doing something on the inside immediately you know you shouldn't have done that because we don't have that nature of sin and death in us anymore. We're new persons. We're new creations in Christ Jesus and God did a great job of it. You're brand new. His work of making you a new person wasn't a failure. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus and you have the life of God in you now. You have the nature of God and the ability of God within you. God himself actually dwells in you by his spirit. He made you holy and by the Holy Spirit he comes and lives in us and you have this life and nature and ability of God within you. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. So, so Jesus dealt with this sin problem that causes us not to be able to live well. He dealt with this old man that's corrupt and dominated by selfishness. And he did something and he made us brand new. I like 1 John chapter 5. Notice how John said it. <clears throat> this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. Here's the word Zoe again. Eternal life. On the inside of you, you have eternal life. Eternal life doesn't mean you're living forever. Everybody's living forever. People who have death on the inside of them, they're going to go to the kingdom of death. People who have life on the inside of them are going to go to the kingdom of life. This is the record God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. Verse 12 says, he that has the son has what? Life. Zoe, eternal life. Zoe means the life of God. So, so when you have Jesus, you have on the inside of you the life of God. The nature of God's in you. The love nature's in you. That's why Romans 5, 5 says that the love of God's been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. You have the love of God in you. You have that nature in you, the nature to be kind. People that are not born again, they don't have that nature at all. It's not in them. They're self-centered. They're full of death. They're full of sin, and selfishness dominates their life. I mean, all you have to do is go to Black Friday and the beanie bags are on sale, and they open the doors, they'll trample you to death to get a beanie bag. They don't say, excuse me, you can go first. Yes, sir, go ahead, right, just go have your head. No, no, no. Over something as silly as a beanie bag. How come? Well, because there's something on the inside that's messed up, but Jesus Christ is the cure for that, and we have on the inside of us the life of God, the nature of God, and the ability of God, because we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen from you? Everybody say it out loud. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. He freed me from sin. He made me a brand new creation. I'm brand new. I have the life of God in me. Eternal life is in me. The nature of God's in me. The love of God's in me. The faith of God's in me. I thank you, Lord. 
I'm a new person through Jesus Christ. I'm recreated in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things have become new in Jesus' name. Give the Lord some praise for that. That's good. So that brings me to point three. Point three is this. Sanctification is our part. Everybody say that out loud. Sanctification is our part. Now that's a big word, sanctification, that we have in the Bible. You don't already ever any, hear anybody in church talk about sanctification. Sanctification really means to be set apart for holy use or to be made holy and set apart. And God's will is for us to be sanctified. Now here's what I mean by that. Uh, there's a lot of people, if you're just being honest, if you're watching online, if you're here, if you're just being honest and you say, well, I accepted Christ. Because I've been in this same position. I accepted Christ when I was six years old. But as far as my behavior changing, I was still dominated. In fact, my behavior didn't change very much at all on the outside. And there's a whole lot of Christians who, if they were being honest, they'd say, well, yes, I've accepted Jesus, I believe in Him, and I've been born again. But uh, to be honest about it, I still do a whole bunch of the same stuff that I did before I gave my life to Christ. I still have a whole lot of the same problems that I did. Why is that? I mean, I still lose my temper. I still have trouble with pornography or immorality. I still have trouble with drinking or drugs. What it, why, then... I know I've given my life to Christ, but, but I still have problem uh, with my behavior on the outside. Well, what's, what's the deal with that then? Why is it that way, even though we're new on the inside? Well, the problem, the Bible says, is this big word called sanctification. Notice what it says right here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Finally then, brethren... Now here's the Holy Spirit. Notice Paul is inspired by the Spirit, and he's writing to us, brethren and sistren. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us, how you ought to walk and to please God. Everybody say, how you ought to walk. So, I mean, it must matter to God how you walk. And he's not just talking about not being bow-legged. He's talking about how you live. For you know what commandment we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. What's the will of God? Your sanctification. And we live in kind of in a, in a culture now they don't want to talk about sanctification or anything about that. They just want to talk about, well, everybody's doing it. God loves, God loves everybody. Everything's all right. Well, the Bible says this is the will of God, your sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality and that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, that means his body, in sanctification and honor. Uh, you got to learn how to possess your own body in sanctification and honor. Well, what does that mean, sanctification? It means that you have to learn to let the new man, the new man you are, the new creature in Christ, actually begin to dominate the behavior of the body. And that's where a lot of Christians fail. They don't let the man on the inside begin to dominate the man on the outside. And it's not easy. I mean, I'd like to be able to tell you this is an easy thing to do. It's a piece of cake. I mean, all you have to do is just, there's a few little things. No, this, this is a lifelong challenge that you're going to have is letting the man on the inside dominate the man on the outside. But that's what sanctification is, and it is the will of God. And it's the will of God for you, no matter what age you are, it's the will of God that you let the man on the inside begin to dominate the behavior on the outside. Now, Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I keep under my body, he said. You would say it this way, I keep under control of my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So sanctification is the process of letting the man on the inside begin to dominate the body to keep it under control because your body was trained and influenced by this old man that was full of death and sin. And you have to learn then to control that body and retrain the body and retrain the mind and the thoughts. So <clears throat> I'm just going to give you two things as we, as we close here. 
I'm going to give you two things that you can begin to do right now. Maybe you look at your life and you say, well, you know, I still lose my temper like I did. I still have a problem with this. All right, what are some things you can do right now that will cause you to love well, that will put you on the road to letting the man on the inside dominate the outside? That's what I want to do, and that's what I'm closing with. There are two things that you can focus on. These are simple things to do, but they're not easy. They're simple, but they're not easy. Do you know what I mean by that? I mean, uh, if there's a barbell with 300 pounds on it, and you lay down, and you've pushed it up, and I have pushed up 300 pounds. I didn't do it yesterday, but I have done it. <laughs> it is simple, but it's not easy. Are you here? It's simple, but it's not easy. In other words, it's not a complicated thing, but it's always not easy to do. So these things are simple. How do you let the man on the inside dominate the man on the outside? That's what belongs to all of us. Sanctification is the will of God. Number one, you need to work to change your thoughts or your thinking. you got to work to change your thoughts. What's going in here? What are you thinking about? What's affecting your mind? Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. We read from it earlier, but notice he goes on to say this in Ephesians 4 verse 22 Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your old, unrenewed self, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion and be constantly renewed. Everybody say renewed. In the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. you got to do something about your mind, the spirit of your mind, what you're thinking. You you got to you got to deal with this up here. That's one of the things you have to do. You you, you got to strip off this old man and his old behavior by doing something about your thinking and doing something about your mind. Well, how do you do that? How do you change your thinking? Well, you got to put different things in. You got to strip yourself of this way that you used to think and the way you used to 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 uh, your imaginations and the way you used it and what the, all of that junk you were putting in your mind. You got to strip those things out. Jesus said it this way. Now, Jesus, you know, he, he's talking, and he's, he, he's talking really about farming, and he's bringing it into that. And he says in John 15, 3, you are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. And he's talking about, the Amplified says, you're cleansed and pruned through the word. So how do you, how do you change your thinking? Well, you have, to, you have to put the word of God in your thinking. You have to put the word of God in your mind. Because the Word of God, you know, James was Jesus' half-brother. And James said the Word of God's like, like a mirror, and you behold it. Except it's a supernatural mirror, and when you read the Word of God and you start beholding that and focusing on God's Word, you get changed into what you're reading. And he said that's the kind of mirror the Word of God is. So that's why that Jesus said you're cleaned through the Word. So the more of the Word you put in, the time you put in in God's Word, hearing God's Word spoken, reading God's Word yourself, reading good godly things, thinking about the Scripture, meditating it, putting that in, it cleanses you, and it starts changing your way of thinking. It starts changing your ideas. It changes you up here. And then that helps you then. Then all of a sudden your soulish realm and your spirit can dominate your flesh, and it helps tremendously dominate your flesh. So you got to do something about what you're putting in, what you're reading. you got to start feeding the right things on the inside of you. you got to start feeding the love nature. Now, you've heard me talk about love a lot, but I had to start feeding the love nature because, I, I mean, I had a short fuse. I'm being honest about it. I mean, my grandfather shot and killed his neighbor. He had a short fuse. Well, that kind of, what was kind of just naturally speaking kind of in my family, bad temper. Okay, so, so how did I get out of that? Because I, I could see after Veld and I married, I, I'm not going to be able to be married very long. I'm always hurting her, and I was. Shooting my mouth off, getting mad, being a horse's person. <laughs> so I did this process, and I took 1 Corinthians 13 about the love chapter, and the Amplified Bible says, love endures long and is patient and kind. Well, that didn't describe me at all. But I started feeding that and meditating on that. Now, I don't mean I played at it. I started feeding that. 
and computers had just kind of come out, and we had one at work, and you could, you could actually type something in, push a button, and print it out over here on the printer. Woo-hoo! <laughs> Man, I was uptown. And I printed that out, and I printed me several copies of it, and I put one by my bed, one in my back pocket, one in my car. And before I'd go to bed at night, I'd spend, honestly, probably about 15 minutes meditating, love enders, longs, patient, kind, and I started working on that. And you know, within 30 days, my behavior changed dramatically. I mean, it took about 30 days, but I mean, I started getting patient. I mean, I didn't even know what patience was. All of a sudden, I mean, I, I'm not losing my temper. Why? Because I, all of a sudden, I'm cleansed out all of this garbage. You know, impatience is really pride. Just thought I'd throw that out there for you. But anyway, impatience is really pride. And so I, I, I washed and I kept on, and I still have to go back and meditate that. I still feed that. But that's what he's talking about. You, you got to renew your thinking. And he says you got to constantly do it. We live in a world that's programming information in your mind and thoughts and how you ought to act and what you ought to look at, and adultery's okay, and immorality's okay, and this is okay, and it's programming all of this garbage constantly. So you have to be very careful about what you're putting in. You need to read God's Word, hear God's Word, meditate God's Word, and stop the garbage from getting in. Stop watching a bunch of garbage, reading a bunch of garbage, hearing a bunch of garbage, and, and letting that junk get in on the inside of you. If you'll do that, you'll begin to change. Somebody said, Pastor, I don't have time for all that. Well, let's, let me ask you this. How much time do you spend on social media? I mean, I'm just wondering how much time you spend on Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram and, and Googling this and all of that time you spend doing that, plus the watching the whatever you watch on television, how much time you spend doing that? Don't tell me you don't have time because I know you have time. It just, it just matters if you want to get in this, if you really want to be sanctified and you really want your behavior to change. I told you it was simple, but it's not easy. So you have to decide. That's why he said, this is the will of God. Now, you can do the will of God or you cannot do the will of God. I mean, that's up to you. The second thing that is important about this process that you can do, you can do, I can do, is you've got to stop unhealthy relationships. Y'all quit shouting and sit down out there. I said you got to stop unhealthy relationships. Notice what the scripture says here in Ephesians chapter 5. Very interesting. Ephesians 5. Let there be no filthiness, obscenity, indecency, nor foolish and sinful, silly and corrupt talk, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting or becoming, but instead, uh, uh, are not fitting or becoming, but instead voice your thankfulness to God. Verse 5. For be sure of this, that no person practicing sexual vice or impurity in thought or in life or one who's covetous, who has lustful desire for the property of others and is greedy for gain, for he in effect is an idolater. Has an, anybody like that has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one delude and deceive you with empty excuses and groundless arguments for these sins. For through these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of rebellion and disobedience. So do not associate or be sharers with them. Oh, is that in your Bible? Yeah. Ephesians 5, 7. Do not associate or be sharers with them. You know, I, I've been pastor now for quite a few years, and, and it's amazing to me. I, I remember one man, and he didn't go to this church, so I'm not, so I'm not and I certainly wouldn't tell, but and I normally wouldn't have talked to him, but somebody who does go to church, you know, asked me, will you please help him? He's really sincere. He's just gone a lot, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, I'll talk to him. So he comes in, I talked to him, and he said, Pastor, here's my problem. You know, I was, you know, I'm a Christian. I was born again, you know, when I was a little boy. But the whole issue is I just have a problem sleeping with women. I, I mean, I just I'm, have a problem with immorality, and I just sleep with, I just sleep regularly with other women. I said, Really? I said, well, kind of tell me what, you know, how does this happen, you know, what, what's the deal with this? Well, you know, I don't know, you know, we just, <clears throat> I'll invite them over to my house and I'll fix dinner and, and we'll sit down and just talk and next thing I know, you know, we're in the bedroom. Well, so you invite, you're having problems sleeping with women, so you invite them over to your house where you're alone and you're fixing dinner, your bedroom's right there and the bed's right over there. 
and then you wonder why you end up in the bed with this woman over here. You wonder why you end up. It's because you're stupid. <laughs> That's why. You're stupid. I said, if you'll do public things, probably if you just take her bowling, then you probably won't get naked and have sex at the bowling alley. Most people can keep their clothes on at the bowling alley. So maybe you should just go to the bowling alley, or maybe you should do something in public with other people instead of getting alone with some woman that you're going to be tempted to sleep with. I love you, but you're stupid. <laughs> Can I get an amen from you? I mean, so you got you to watch your soul, who you're hanging around with. What are you doing and where are you going? Uh, if you want to have sanctification in your life, and the Bible says you should, and I believe you do if you're a Christian, you got to watch what you're thinking, and then you got to watch who you're hanging around with and what you're listening to. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, here's Amplified Bible. Notice, do not be so deceived and misled. Evil companionships, communion and associations corrupt and deprave good manners and morals and character. So, so who are you hanging around with? And, and so you have to be smart. And, and you know, I'm going to just talk to the parents. I mean, can I say something to parents? Uh, you don't let your daughter go out with somebody and not knowing where they're going. You know, it, it was common. You know, I grew up in the 70s. It was common to just say, uh, well, now you be in by midnight. Where are you going anyway? Well, we're going to the show. Well, be sure you're in by midnight. Well, the show started at 7 Show's over at 10, and from 10 to 12, what are you doing? You know what you're doing? You're out there parked out there looking at the moon, singing, when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, it's some more huh? And you're out there trying to get her to look at the moon, telling her how beautiful she is, and you end up in the back seat. I mean, if you're a parent, you need to grow a brain. You need to find out when the movie starts, check them up. You know, I'd tell my, you know, I have a daughter. She's grown, married. But I mean, I'd tell them, you know, I may come to the movies too and just see if you're there. And I did. I wouldn't pay. I'd just go up and say, I'm just going to go and check and see if my daughter's in here. And I'd just walk in there and just wave and then just leave. And then my daughter go home. <laughs> I mean, I, you say, well, Pastor, you're, you're a... You're, I mean, you're a hard guy. I know, but I raised a virgin that got married. And, you know, I mean, everything's cool. That's my job. So, I mean, I don't care if I make a few people a little bit upset. No big deal. I, I, she, you know, and we live in the culture. Teenagers, well, you're invading my privacy. You ain't got no privacy while you're at my house. That's my house. <laughs> what privacy you think you got? I mean, you looked under my bed, and you looked in this, and you looked on my phone. Well, I'll look on your phone. If I want to look on your phone, I'm paying for the phone. I'm about to meddle. I better quit here. Okay. <laughs> totally different sermon. I don't know how I got on that, but I got on it. So, so you got to be careful who you hang with and what your kids are doing, and that includes to you, you grown-ups, too. You got to be smart. If you do those things, watch about what you're thinking about and watch who you're hanging with and what you're doing when you're hanging with them, then you can get in this process of sanctification and the love of God will begin to dominate you. Can I, can I get an amen from you?